Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Emerald Ashbor University. My name is Robin Osborne, and I'm coming to you live from Michigan State University, along with my EAB University colleagues, Amy Stone from The Ohio State University and Adam Witte from Purdue University. We welcome you today to this presentation on wood utilization options for urban trees infested by invasive species. We have two expert presenters today. Our first presenter is Brian Brashaw, Director of the Wood Materials and Engineering Program at the Natural Resources Research Institute at the University of Minnesota, Duluth. His broad-based research focuses on non-destructive testing and evaluation methods for wood materials and structures, applied product development, resource utilization, renewable energy, and technology transfer. He coordinates the Institute's Physical and Mechanical Testing Laboratory. He is also the author or co-author of more than 300 technical reports and publications, including the popular Wood and Timber Condition Assessment Manual, published by the Forest Product Society. Brian holds BS and MS degrees from the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point and Washington State University. He recently received his PhD from Mississippi State University. Dr. Bob Ross is our second presenter. He is a project leader at the USDA Pro Forest Products Laboratory in Madison, Wisconsin, and his research focuses on the development and use of non-destructive evaluation technologies for wood products and structures. Bob has worked on a variety of projects, including in-place assessment of members of the USS Constitution. He has written or co-authored more than 200 technical reports and articles, and jointly holds 29 US and foreign patents. He was technical editor for the centennial edition of the Wood Handbook, Wood as an Engineering Material, and he is a fellow in the International Academy of Wood Science. He holds BS and MS degrees from the Michigan Technological in University and a PhD from Washington State. Before we get started, I want to remind you that your comments and questions are welcome today, and please feel free to type them in the chat pod on the left of your screen. We will make a note of them, and our presenters will respond to the questions after the presentation to keep the flow of the webinar smooth. Your feedback is also very important to us to keep these free webinars coming. So please stay tuned until the end when we will be providing a link to a survey that we hope you'll take the time to fill out. For those of you needing CEUs, your survey information is necessary for us to process them. We will be sending out an EAB goodie bag to the first 10 people who fill out the survey. But even if you filled you've received a goodie bag in the past, we do hope you'll give us feedback on this webinar as well. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later today or possibly tomorrow, depending on how quickly my webinar, my webmaster can get to it on www.emerald-bore.info. You will also find the recordings for all previous EAB University webinars there. Thank you for attending today, and we hope you are ready to learn a lot from this presentation. Welcome, Brian, and you're ready to get started. Thank you, Robin, and good morning. Um, good morning, Bob. This is a, a overview of a technical publication that we put together um, up and was published in uh, in 2012 and, and excuse me in 2013, uh, focused on on different utilization options for urban trees. Our goal in putting this publication together was really to try to bring together all sorts of information in, in one location so that we could um, f answer appropriately the questions that were coming from a wide range of folks, uh, everybody from uh, foresters to landowners uh, to resource professionals to sawmills to dry kiln operators. So this manual was put together in, with funding uh, from the USDA uh, Forest Service Wood Education Resource Center, uh, the great folks in, uh, in Princeton, West Virginia. Um, Susan Stam uh, worked with us to put together the graphic layout and technical editing, and uh, we had a number of excellent cooperators as we move forward with this uh, publication. As I, as I mentioned, was finished in late 2012 and presented uh, and is available in 2013. 
Uh, here's a cover shot of the, the manual itself, and, and as I indicated, you know, our goal was to really put this manual together to cover four sets of information uh, that allows information on, on wood technology. It provides access and in, in important information to needed markets, but also technical information. And what we're really focused on is things that are affected by invasive species and typically urban. So even the cover here is in southeast Wisconsin. Uh, this was a urban harvesting trial that was conducted. Uh, Wisconsin DNR, um, Renewal Resources in, in Michigan, and, and a number of other great folks, uh, City of Oak uh, Creek. Um, but again, utilizing urban wood, and you can actually see a cut to length harvester. Uh, the key in all of this is really identifying and developing uh, markets for the entire entirety of the resource. So that may include saw logs and it may include um, biomass from tops and limbs. But again, those are the key opportunities. We did focus on, on a number of species and we'll talk about that here uh, in a little bit. So the layout of the manual, it's four sections. Um, this morning, uh, Bob and myself are going to present uh, parts one, two, and three. I think that there's been a, a number of excellent presentations and information available on heat treatment, um, especially uh, uh, heat sterilization of firewood. Uh, so while part four is referenced uh, today um, and is uh, in detail in the, in the uh, workbook itself, uh, we're not going to focus on, on heat treatment of wood today uh, during the webinar. I think there's a number of good resources available. So with that, I'm going to present part one. Uh, Bob is going to present part two, and then I'll um, come back with, with part three when I'm finished. So the focus that the Forest Service asked us to look at was, again, urban forests and what invasive species are really affecting um, our regional uh, forests and, and mostly in the northeastern area of the United States, which is actually a 33-state region. Um, what are invasives? You know, we're really focused on those that are non-native to the ecosystem. Uh, many invasives, when we, I think when most people think about invasives, they're thinking about things that are outside of, uh, that are not native to the United States. But in the case of thousand cankers disease, which affects uh, black walnut, that is a sp uh, species that is um, present in the western half of the United States, but it's now recently uh, starting to have a significant impact in the northeastern area. So the emphasis of today's um, webinar and presentation are, are going to talk about, uh, and just briefly here this morning, uh, emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, and gypsy moth, uh, along with thousand cankers disease. So this part one really kind of gets everybody up to speed on, on, on what these invasives um, uh, are, where they're located, where the quarantines are, and some of the background information that, again, just allows us to put all of the documents together into one uh, one manual, kind of a one-stop shop. So um, m many of you uh, probably uh, on the call today are, are incredibly familiar with the biology and life cycle of emerald ash borer. And we talked briefly about that, but, but I want to think about it from a utilization standpoint. So at the time that, that, uh, that Bob and, and myself uh, started to work on this manual, so I'm right here in Duluth, Minnesota, uh, up just on the, the um, uh, lower western tip of Lake Superior. Bob is down here in, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. But at the time we put this manual together, my hope was that um, the information that was going to be there would be, would be pertinent to my region at the time that emerald ash borer was identified um, in and around uh, northern Minnesota. And as you can see, there's a substantial infestation in southern Wisconsin, around Minneapolis and the Twin Cities. But only a year ago, um, and probably a lot sooner than most people in northern Minnesota expected, uh, a USDA APHIS quarantine was issued for um, the most northwestern county in Wisconsin, Douglas County. So that's now about seven miles um, just across the river from, uh, from where I live here in, in northern Minnesota. So while we put this manual together with hopes that it would provide a lot of support to those communities, I was uh, a little bit hopeful it would be a few more years out before we really were starting to deal with it uh, in, my, in my home county. 
So just a quick um, overview of a couple of initiatives that we that we highlight, and these are in much more detail. Again, uh, I see that um, a couple of folks already put the link uh, out there as to the wood utilization uh, manual that we're talking about. So it is available to download. You can pull it uh, from the EAB uh, website as well. So there's a couple of federal initiatives that that have been done uh, through through primarily USDA. The Animal Plant Health Inspection Service is certainly uh, focused on detection, control, uh, eradication, uh, education activities, um, really encouraging and engaging folks from a regulatory aspect, but also from an education standpoint. Um, you know, uh, the advertisement I have there is we, we promise Minnesota we won't move firewood. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've been from Duluth to Minneapolis and seen billboards and other uh, informational uh, outreach uh, from the Minnesota Department of Ag and others uh, to really try to reinforce that message. The Forest Service has done incredible work uh, through uh, a number of branches and, and arms uh, from some of their research laboratories in biology in, uh, in, in Michigan and other places uh, through the Forest Products Laboratory, uh, which is a national laboratory in Madison, really focused on, on control management. And then where Bob and I get involved is, is on utilization, uh, some of the market development and market research. So again, some outstanding uh, efforts and initiatives uh, that are easily identified through, um, through internet searches and also through uh, eab.info. There's a couple of state programs I'd like to highlight that I think have done a tremendous job. Uh, for those of you that, that are, are, are um, uh, logged in this morning from Michigan, you're certainly familiar with the Southeast Michigan uh, RC&D uh, district. Uh, really the initial uh, organization in partnership with uh, the um, USDA Forest Service uh, with the state of Michigan uh, with Michigan State, um, with a host of other public and private cooperators, cities, counties, has really um, provided a lot of early leadership, a lot of early understanding of what can we use ash for. Uh, we understand that we're going to have substantial volumes available, both from an urban standpoint and from a natural forest standpoint. And Jessica Simons and others from uh, from the RCND, the Southeast Michigan RCND, have really done an incredible job, and continue to do so. Um, you know, very uh, extensive website and and project information. In Illinois, um, the EAB Wood Utilization Team has come together and really looked across the entire supply chain or affected chain uh, from wood from arborists and sawyers, woodworkers, and all the way to end users. So I spent a lot of time thinking about how to engage uh, the public, how to engage industry, how to engage arborists uh, throughout the process to with an eye toward utilization. I think that, that we have a, a resource. Um, we are in much more of a bioeconomy uh, than we ever have. And, and I think about bioeconomy being everything from uh, furniture, flooring, and natural materials that go into our homes and businesses and buildings uh, to, um, to liquid fuels and other biochemical and bio, biopower resources. So the EAB wood utilization team has uh, really done a fine job and they're highlighted a little bit more detail in the manual itself. Um, <clears throat> obviously the, the go-to place, uh, you know, searching EAB um, Emerald Ash Borer is, is this website that is hosted um, by Michigan State and, and, uh, and Robin is certainly the, the Robin Newsborn is, is key here. Um, one of our goals in, in putting this manual together was to, to add and incorporate more information onto this site that talked about all the use options. There was, uh, you know, obviously a tremendous amount of resources here. But our goal was to bring uh, forward uh, this manual so that, that it would really be in, in the kind of the number one go-to place uh, for, uh, for EAB. And uh, the most searched, I, I, I don't know, Robin can tell you more details, but I think there's probably been millions of hits uh, to emeraldashboard.info. So um, that was our goal, is to put this electronic uh, document and manual available. We printed about 500 uh, paper copies of it along the way. I think we're probably down to uh, somewhere around 100. So we certainly can uh, provide some, 
uh, some some uh, published uh, printed versions as as people do request and and uh, you can just uh, send me an email after the uh, afterwards or contact Robin and she can get us connected. Gypsy moth. Um, again, you know, here I am, um, Duluth, Minnesota, uh, right on the edge where we just uh, now have two quarantine counties uh, here in the state. It's certainly um, been a um, a key and engaged topic um, in terms of quarantines and wood movement uh, for the forest products industry. But it is again an invasive that has. Um, a direct impact on hardwood uh, and softwood lumbers, but you know, primarily hardwood that affects our um, our region, and uh, so we do do provide some background information on uh, on gypsy moth and and uh, and some of the activities and, and efforts that are taking place. Certainly, a very destructive um, invasive that uh, some folks are are very uh, aware of is the Asian longhorn beetle, um, as you can see there in the uh, the upper right. Um, a very uh, um, uh, unique looking uh, beetle that that certainly I think uh, puts uh, fear into uh, into uh, regional foresters into uh, land managers and resource professionals um, because it does have a wide range of hardwood species that it's going to be affecting uh, the picture is probably um, of the states affected um, certainly we have Ohio uh, New York and Massachusetts. Um, Chicago and Illinois has been considered eradicated as has um, uh, New Jersey itself. So um, emerald ash or excuse me Asian longhorned beetle.com if you haven't been there it's a USDA APHIS site um, it's uh, again the the go-to place for key information on on ALB and what's being done and where the eradications are taking place and, and some of the activities that are present. So again, a tremendous uh, resource uh, to, uh, to take a look at, AsianLonghornBeetle.com. And the last one I want to uh, share a little bit is to have some uh, you know, a little bit of a conversation on thousand cankers disease. So again, um, it is present in the western United States. Um, it is considered as of about three years ago a threat to eastern black walnut. Um, it's a combination of the walnut twig beetle and a fungus that it carries as it embeds into the trees. Um, certainly, you know, it's, it's becoming a um, a topic of concern to the point where many states have issued quarantine on green uh, transport of green uh, lumber uh, logs. So Minnesota initiated a very uh, rigid uh, quarantine uh, prohibiting any green or bark on material coming into the state uh, trying to limit again the infestation and and we know that that black walnut is a very um, important commercial species um, for furniture and veneer and moldings um, so again it's it's a it's a it's something that we need to think about and be aware of uh, to understand what potential impacts and quarantine effects um, tremendous amount of information at, at thousandcankers.com uh, cooperation between Purdue and the and the U.S. Forest Service. So again, um, I encourage for those of you that that uh, um, are thinking about um, uh, thousand cankers and and black walnut to uh, to think about that uh, and access that resource. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn this over to uh, to Bob Ross, as as uh, as Robin indicated. Bob is a project leader at the USDA Forest Products Laboratory in Madison, Wisconsin, and has really been a leader in trying to uh, field calls and information and drive the process moving forward. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Robin, am I on? Can everybody hear me? Yes, Bob, you're good to go. Okay, okay. Well, thank you guys for uh, spending the time today. And I know we got 50 participants out there. Thank you for spending the time. And <clears throat> excuse me, Robin, thank you for organizing it and putting all those things together. And Brian, of course, thank you for working with me on it and um, and and laying the background for it. As part of this manual, what we tried to do, <clears throat> we were starting to field a lot of questions on. 
what are some of the basic properties and wood technology issues related to some of these hardwood species? Because um, as a national laboratory, we're always trying to find the highest, best use for the material. We, we go back and we're founded on the principles that uh, all the Leopold and the others had as, as far as conservation of our resources. So, um, so while there's some really good opportunities for it to be used for um, uh, biofuels, energy, that type of thing, there's some uh, some of these hardwoods, especially the ashes and things, just have some wonderful attributes and characteristics that make it a very, very high value basic raw material. Um, so part two of this manual we put together it basically focuses on the wood properties of the hardwood species that are affected by these invasives. Um, if you would, <coughs> excuse me, prior to this manual being produced, you would have had to go to about four or five different sources of information and search the web and, and do that kind of thing to, uh, to keep things moving. So what we try to do is put it all in one. Um, Robin, I'm trying to move this thing. Okay, go down to the bottom of the screen there. You'll see the arrows pointing um, left and right. Do you see those? Okay, there you go. Now you got it. Now you just need to make sure your, your um, microphone is on because we're not hearing you. There we go. Okay, got it now? Okay. Well, our objective in putting this part of the book together was we wanted to provide a starting point for <clears throat> for folks who are looking for basic information on these on these species of wood. And um, so we did that. And we wanted to put that, uh, provide that basic information in one source. Um, so what I'm going to do is briefly go through this. Now the, what we did is we summarized things from a broad range of technical literature that uh, was available. A lot of it from the Forest Products Laboratory. Uh, some of it was, was quite old but still very solid. Uh, some of it was available in electronic format and some was not. So it was important to pull all this stuff together. And that's what we did. So I'm going to share some of that with you today. The focus we had for this was on eastern hardwood species, and I've listed those in front of you. The ashes, birches, elms, uh, the maples, the oaks, willows. Um, some of the characteristics we were looking at, uh, the ones that are primarily important for use and for products. And, and that range of products, everything from flooring and millwork <coughs> to structural applications. So I'm going to go through those just a little bit. There's some technical information on the book. We have both common and scientific names, various descriptions of the species or species groupings. Some of the oaks are grouped together. In addition to that, we've got micrographs of every of uh, each species of the cross sections, low magnification, about a five, five to ten power magnification. Some of the characteristics of them. Uh, such as the grain of the wood, its texture, any decorative features such as the uh, color or figure that you might see in it. On the lower right, on the um, on your right hand side of that slide you'll see the cross sections of some low magnification uh, uh, slides of or, or views of the uh, uh, some ash and in addition to that down on the bottom that's a nice piece of ash lumber uh, uh, and to show highlight some of that. Other information people are asking about and we put in their book, uh, moisture content for green wood, heartwood, and sapwood. That's very important when we start talking about moving these species, uh, moving materials around, but also drying this material. Do we have to dry it in a dry kiln versus air drying? Uh, where do we start from? What's the basis of it? If you look on the right hand side of this slide, you'll see a classic example of some of the things you're all worried about. And that's the shrinkage and swelling characteristics. As it dries, obviously, uh, wood shrinks and swells and does a lot of strange things. So we gathered up all the information we could on the transverse volumetric and longitudinal shrinkage characteristics of these various hardwood species so that we have starting points to work from. 
the other thing we looked at it and is included in here is the working qualities. Now this particular part of it we had to search our library pretty intensively, but there's a very nice publication that was done in the mid-1960s that focused on planing characteristics, shaping, turning, boring, splitting characteristics for nails and wood screws of these various wood species. So brought that up to date and pulled that all into the book so it's in one spot for everyone to, to start from. Other technical information, basic things like such as the density or specific gravity of the material, it's decay resistance. Um, and then we do have information on there because we get a lot of calls in on what's the basic mechanical properties of this stuff. How stiff is it or its modulus of elasticity? How strong is it or its modulus of rupture? Um, uh, hardness characteristics, which is very important if we're going to use these species or any of this wood in um, flooring applications or any kind of millwork applications. And, and compression perpendicular to the fiber axis and again that's another important property for using it in flooring and, and millwork. Sources of information, um, if you really want to get back to this, as I said, uh, all the machining and that information was was in a bulletin published by the USDA Forest Service Forest Products Lab 1962. Um, I if you need information on it, give me a call, give me an email. I don't know that that's available electronically, but all the information in there is included in the EAB book. Uh, textbook of wood, and, or excuse me, of dendrology, and then of course we relied very heavily on the latest edition of the Wood Handbook, Wood as an Engineering Material. That's available from the Forest Products Laboratory's website, free of charge to everybody. Uh, it's a fairly large document, about 500 pages, so we, and it covers a range of species, hardwoods and softwoods as, as well. And so uh, we relied on that, but uh, that's the foundation document we use for what we did today. Other sources of information that, that are available from our website, the Dry Kiln Operators Manual, which, which provides basic uh, information on the excuse me, starting points for establishing dry kill schedules for these materials. It's available from our website free of charge. It's uh, USDA Ag Handbook 188. Um, I don't believe there's many hard copies available right now or left, So, uh, but it is available from our, our, our website. And of course another one that's very important is a, a, a very specific to these materials in its USDA Handbook 528, Dry and Eastern Hardwood. That's also available from our website. So those are really good source of information if you want to use this material in, in applications where you have to dry it. And with that, I'll turn it back to Brian. Thanks a lot, Bob. Thanks a lot, Bob. Appreciate it. Appreciate uh, one of the things that we... Bob, could you mute your phone again? Or your microphone? Thank you. So one of the things that we did try to do in the manual um, was to create some links. So there are a lot of hyperlinks to a lot of this key information uh, if you're able to, uh, to when you download the, the manual online. So that, that for instance, a dry kiln and, and some of the other links are, are directly there. So, so part three. Let's, you know, we're focused on ash. Um, certainly, the the most uh, largest volume uh, species affected by invasives that we're dealing with right now, um, based on on, on EAB. But uh, most of the things that I'm really going to talk about here are uh, pertinent to almost all hardwood species that we're talking about, uh, whether it be ash, maple, um, some of our other uh, hardwoods uh, like um, like walnut. Um, so again, you know, take this information and apply it uh, broadly. But one of the keys to all of this is connecting with the industry and connecting with the industry oftentimes through their trade associations. So one of the things that I think that the manual does both in in, uh, uh, in chapter one and then again uh, in chapter three as we kind of break into, into these applications and, and entities uh, is all of the trade associations that reflect um, various industry sectors, whether it be railroad ties or hardwood flooring uh, and everything in between.
So Jessica Simons, as I indicated before, Jessica um, helped put together a, a couple of uh, uh, sections for this manual focused on the Urban Wood Project and some of the efforts of the uh, Southeast Michigan RCND efforts that she's been involved with over the last number of years. So ash and, and other hardwood species affected by invasives can be used in a wide range. Um, everything I think we're often most familiar with uh, with ash, white ash as a baseball bat uh, material, but and and maybe snowshoes, uh, both sporting uh, activities. But it's a beautiful uh, character uh, with with clear and evident grain patterns um, that can be utilized in a lot of different ways. Um, it can be used in wood fuels all the way to wood pallets with a large amount of work being done uh, in the arts and crafts uh, communities itself. Um, it's been used in every form from standing uh, trees to uh, ground mulch and pellets uh, and particles for pellets. So this is certainly a great uh, visual of all of the different kinds of things that that uh, that ash can be uh, converted into. So I'm just going to kind of walk through the, you know, from from the the, the original tree form, uh, all the way into uh, really some specialty products and, and engineered materials uh, that that it can be utilized. And and so there's a couple of great uh, examples. Uh, Trevorwood Branch Library, uh, again, utilized um, standing ash trees that had actually been harvested from that site as part of the um, as part of the expansion uh, project itself. There's also a company in in uh, in Wisconsin actually it's called Whole Trees LLC and they're a company that's been uh, pushing on to a decade here that's really developed a, a, a wide range of structural uh, building systems surrounding and utilizing um, trees themselves and it not just um, standing uh, bowls like you see here where there are, the branches have been removed but actually taking structural advantage of the um, oftentimes the upper structural branches in the system itself so there's some unique uh, work that they have done and uh, focused around uh, ash as a utilization in a, in a tree form we're mostly familiar with lumber, right? When people think about um, hardwoods, they think about lumber. And this is really the core base material that is used for furniture and flooring and cabinetry and other applications. Um, there are uh, National Hardwood Lumber Association grades of involved. There's also um, more custom grades like character. Uh, lumber is produced in high efficient large hardwood sawmills across uh, the United States, but it's also produced in um, small portable band sawmills that are that are available in regional areas. And I think the key, as I think about um, a lot of this utilization and application, is understanding um, your communities, understanding your areas, understanding what potential customers exist, uh, what large construction firms are there, what the engineering and architectural communities are, uh, to really start to drive connection and connection between local use and uh, local resource. So, but it's key to find application for everything from bark to Uh, limbs, tops, um, unmerchantables to those highest quality saw or veneer logs that are possible. So for lumber, you know, lumber is either green or dry. Um, typically it's it's referenced in a, in a quarter basis. So four quarter be essentially one inch thick lumber, eight quarter be about two inch thick lumber. Um, sawn lumber can be anywhere from two to ten inch uh, widths depending on uh, on the resource itself and the kind of mill uh, that's present. As I mentioned before, there's really two grading systems that are used. One is the National Hardwood Lumber Association grade. So that's uh, FAS is face and slack. So that's the highest quality, essentially not free clear material. Uh, 3A would have much more defects and knots and other uh, um, uh, character um, um, or grade limiting um, uh, characteristics present. 
Um, but oftentimes we see this uh, more and more as a relationship and a clear definition of grades um, that are simpler. So a uh, portable bandsaw mill isn't going to have their lumber graded to the National Hardwood Lumber Association grades. They're going to typically offer grades that are, are, more, um, are more distinct, clear or character or character naughty and some combination in between. As you'll see on the right side, there are tremendous uh, resources available uh, through a number of these um, uh, trade associations that represent the industry, uh, manufacturers, resource professionals, suppliers, uh, and affiliates. Um, Hardwood Manufacturers Association is certainly, you know, jumps right out there, National Hardwood Lumber Association. Uh, from a component standpoint, you tend to look at the Wood Component Manufacturers Association, Wood Products Manufacturers Association. And then there's some that are more regional, like Appalachian uh, Group. So again, um, those that are doing export would be the AHAC, American Hardwood Export Council. So again, a variety of opportunities and resources and connections that can be made with all of these folks. Veneer. Ash veneer is beautiful. Um, there are significant quantities of veneer grade and quality logs available. Uh, those coming from urban areas, there needs to be uh, caution and assessment for metal contamination. But again, it, it typically ends up being a very beautiful um, uh, wood that is relatively easy to peel. Um, again, the challenges, and this is where um, certainly, I have an even greater appreciation for quarantines and travel restrictions and compliance agreements. So it is possible through those kinds of situations to move roundwood um, through compliance agreements to those that can take and create the highest and best value. And I think that's part of the situation is while I understand the ease in taking um, ash or other invasive species uh, that, are, that have been affected by invasive species and you can turn them into mulch or fuel or chips, they're, those are low value. And there is higher value available that can be merchandised and turned into, um, into both lumber and potentially veneer application. I know that there was two demonstration projects, uh, urban logging projects with cut to length harvesters done in Wisconsin. And that was part of the solution, was merchandising, moving the grade logs into sawmill uh, applications, veneer applications, and moving tops, limbs, or other low-grade logs into uh, the pulpwood applications or the energy markets. Furniture. Um, ash furniture, again, can be used to produce residential, commercial product. Um, we certainly are very familiar with um, you know, other species, cherry, oak, um, walnut. Um, but again, ash has found a, a positive home. Um, typically, furniture is clear. You know, there's not a lot of defects. Most knots have been removed uh, from the product. We see even more veneered uh, products than we've ever seen before. So relatively thin veneers, and these can be anywhere from, you know, 1 uh, 16th uh, all the way to 1 100th of an inch thickness. Typically, the, the thicknesses of these veneered surfaces excuse me, are, are 1 32nd, 1 40th, 1 50th of an inch thick. Um, you know, this is an opportunity to engage uh, both with, with custom furniture manufacturers, uh, small furniture manufacturers, but also the potential exists to engage um, large producers and, again, to build on the characteristics of these species and the story of these species uh, affected by, by invasives locally harvested and regionally utilized. So small um, designs, very unique designs have been done. Um, the piece of furniture on the top was part of an art show that the Illinois EAB wood utilization team uh, championed. And again, the focus was to create architectural furniture and, and heirloom furniture and, and, and other types as part from ash and, and to really demonstrate and, and, uh, and create that awareness of the potential. Um, other really large accounts like um, like Herman Miller, and this is uh, products that are available through a uh, furniture retailer known as Room and Board. They're uh, across uh, parts of the United States, uh, New, New York, 
uh, Chicago, Minneapolis, uh, Denver, and I think a number of other regions. But again, utilizing in this case Ash Veneer uh, for a variety of their product families. Cabinetry applications, um, certainly we are seeing increases in the construction trades. Um, the recession in, in eight, 2008 through, through to 2010 um, had a dramatic effect in home building. Uh, we know that um, cabinet manufacturers themselves experienced significant uh, reductions in production and, and employment, but that is uh, certainly growing and we're seeing, again, um, substantial growth in the flooring, uh, cabinetry, and residential markets uh, for wood species. Uh, there's a couple of core trade associations that are affected here, Kitchen Cabinet Manufacturing Association, um, and it, again, these can be small custom shops. Uh, they can be large um, fabrication shops. Millwork. So millwork is, is usually sawn uh, solid lumber, although we're seeing more and more veneer over composite board materials uh, being present. Um, this is engaged with some of the folks in the architectural communities, but think about this as you're molding your trims, your paneling, your doors, uh, any, any moldings around windows, doors, uh, and entries. This is actually um, a really beautiful set of, um, uh, this is a, a commercial um, office space that utilizes ash. So this is black ash from Minnesota. So we had veneered products here. We have lumber products here, um, both from a trim standpoint and also from a panel standpoint. So you can see um, taking advantage of some of the very unique uh, characteristics that are available and highlighting. Uh, this was a, a firm um, at the time, this was known as environments. Um, just again, a beautiful uh, entry area as part of a store fixture um, uh, architectural millwork area. Flooring, uh, hardwood flooring is certainly strong and ash can be stained. As you can see, this is a dark uh, stained ash product that again has great potential and markets both from small, medium, and large. Biomass, so it's a key part of, um, of utilizing wood species. Um, I applaud um, many organizations and communities that have really tried to think about creating the most value from the resource that they are intending to harvest. Um, and this is kind of the fallback um, because it's going to be your lowest value and it's going to, uh, but it's going to be able to utilize large volumes as well. So we certainly know that um, firewood is uh, an application. You have small 